Hi friends. So uh, we have covered a, quite a bit of almost 70% of uh, major elements of risk-based engineering. Uh, we discussed uh, uncertainty and sensitivity analysis and their relevance and uh, how they are of uh, practical importance also. Um, PRM uh, pro procedure or salient features we had already discussed. Um, we talked about domain specific assessment also. Um, and then uh, integrated risk assessment, wherein I emphasize that uh, this is a procedure uh, depending on the type of problem, uh, it requires a treatment. Uh, what is relevant from deterministic side? What is relevant from uh, probabilistic side? Uh, and uh, which is uh, important in support of decision making? Um, that is one thing. So uh, in a way, quantitative from probabilistic and qualitative from deterministic. Of course, deterministic uh, gives a physical set of parameters, so which are quantitative in nature. Um, so there, there, there has to be uh, iterative exercises, simulations, because now, now we have the risk-based engineering model, and now iterations have to go on, uh, basically to ensure that the results are as uh, realistic as possible. And uh, in certain cases, uh, where, uh, where uh, we want to be doubly sure about it, uh, certain experiments are also performed or maybe certain data uh, collection and analysis will, uh, will be done when the uh, changes uh, we may call or risk assessment procedure uh, is heading towards the uh, validation verification. So the next step which comes before, uh, before this uh, benchmarking or acceptance criteria uh, and even before PHM uh, is uh, quality attributes. Uh, there are set of attributes uh, which need to be uh, satisfied. In fact, um, there are host of quality attributes uh, which are uh, specific attitude, gen generic attitude as given in some ASME documents as well as uh, in IAEA um, quality PRA guide, uh, attribute guide. So uh, depending on our, uh, our choice or uh, purpose uh, for which we are uh, going for these studies, we will uh, adopt these attri attri uh, attributes for our application. And then uh, the regulators are the, uh, like they are peer reviewers. Uh, they will be the right person uh, whether we have cho chosen the right att uh, attributes and basically they will be uh, deciding uh, the quality of the PSA uh, because uh, and of course they might suggest some uh, review points and uh, they might suggest some improvement also but basically uh, the idea is to improve the quality of PSA and what we mean by quality of PSA is uh, whether uh, whether um, our data model is as correct as possible and then uh, we are meeting the requirement uh, specification which we uh, worked out in the beginning. So, uh, of course, uh, there are maybe uh, hundreds or maybe uh, thousand attributes, uh, if we go, uh, uh, specific to each of the uh, uh, risk assessment level, right? Starting from um, initiating event selection, system analysis, uncertainty analysis, uh, then uh, we go, go for um, uh, result formulation, and before that, of course, uh, sensitivity analysis. So there are something like uh, uh, 10 procedural elements of uh, probabilistic risk assessment and deterministic also. Uh, it, is, it is better, if, even if the quality attributes are not there for deterministic part, it is better that uh, in the interest of our uh, accuracy and uh, applicability of our PSA, our uh, risk-based model, we, we should have the quality attribute for deterministic component also. Now, uh, in nutshell, if I have to go, uh, what, the, what are the questions that are uh, they, they are there, attributes which are there, um, like uh, for, uh, for initiating event category, uh, there could be some attributes 
which will be determining, uh, determining the uh, list of initiating event, whether it is as complete as possible. Nothing substantial or nothing uh, which doesn't look substantial but has potential to become substantial has not been removed. So that means we have to go back to our initial exercise of screening and uh, since we are uh, uh, now having the complete model, uh, we have to again have an iterative look whether we need to induct or remove uh, the, some of the attributes uh, depending on our exercise, you know. And uh, when we talk about completeness, uh, the second point also comes that uh, uh, database. Whether it is initiating event data or whether it is uh, uh, component uh, reliability data. Because um, reliability database forms the backbone of quality of the result itself. Uh, in simple words, if, if I have to say and to emphasize my point, the junk in, junk out. For example, I'll give one example. That uh, when, when, uh, when for design stage, when PRA is done, uh, there is no option that, you know, um, we have to depend on generic databases. But there also, um, our exercise of matching the specification and applicability of the data uh, to our plant uh, should be done uh, should be done fairly and should be complete and should be justifiable. Uh, because uh, initially when the uh, design stage PRA or risk assessment is done, uh, data is not available. Uh, point number two, the, the component when we, when we acquire from the, uh, from the vendor, um, of course not uh, all the vendors will give some, but then they will definitely give their testing records. So testing record itself can be one input. Uh, which can be utilized uh, to think about our own data and whether this particular testing uh, record is matching uh, with uh, any of the existing data in the, um, uh, plant, uh, the generic database. So uh, we have to help ourselves in a manner that the study should be as accurate as possible. Others, other extreme example I will tell you. If the PRA is done exclusively uh, using the generic data set, then uh, we don't know whether this particular uh, uh, risk assessment is applicable to our plant because some data will be highly optimistic, some data will be um, uh, very pessimistic. Uh, of course, a good amount of uh, uh, chunk will be applic applicable also. But that confidence, basically what we are talking about, that we should have confidence in our study uh, or analysis to the extent possible. So one has to be very careful and the data which we are assuming, which are not there, say new component has come, data is not there. Now for such components, uh, uh, what we can do is, uh, uh, lab testing can be done, uh, maybe in a limited sense because uh, uh, elaborate testing may not be possible always, but for electronic component, let's say. Uh, all sorts of testings are possible, possible and if we give the uh, laboratories well in advance uh, what are our component, what are their uh, composition, makeup, make, all those things they can, they can help uh, with us. But sometimes it is not possible. So um, like say we have developed a new uh, type of uh, wall and now this wall has to be used in se for safety functions. So here it is very important that we do lab, test, lab testing. And it has, uh, normally I am aware that uh, uh, analyst, they get it done uh, to get the required confidence. Then the third point is, uh, as you know, PRA is uh, known not only for, uh, it's a probabilistic notion, but it is also known for characterization of uncertainty, which is a uh, huge benefit uh, because uh, point value, um, giving a point value may not be of much use, uh, but then when we give uh, with upper bound and lower bound, uh, then uh, we uh, have uh, some input of aleatory uncertainty uh, that is random uh, randomness which is inherent part of any activity or any component or any system to epistemic uncertainty. Epistemic uncertainty, it creeps in due to shortage of data or uh, adequacy of models, inadequacy of models, 
or it is because of uh, uh, some specification of uh, information was not complete. So um, all these uncertainties have to be handled and their characterization is very important uh, when they f uh, before they form part of uh, fault tree. Especially I will again uh, re-emphasize uh, human reliability. Uh, the data if it is not available uh, then uh, we have to think about how we can use simulator experiments. Simulator experiments um, to some extent you know because they are not plant, they are model of plant. So but then it is better than not having anything. So simulator data can be very useful and in fact in some cases it will be more useful than plant data. Why? Because we can run uh, many of the scenario like uh, class 4 power failure. If you run um, uh, in a simulator, yeah, you can have a lot of data uh, on uh, 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 on timing of failure, uh, night shift, day shift, first shift, uh, or then you know how operator reacts, what is his body movement, or uh, which uh, eventually reflects his mental condition, stress levels. So, uh, uh, because there is a freedom of simulating the uh, same experiment again and again. So, um, there can the simulator can help uh, you know, having this data uh, available on this. And then uh, realistic consideration of human data model analysis. I have already covered. Um, if you don't have data, uh, let's perform some simulator experiment or uh, use some generic data uh, where similar conditions were faced actually. So, same thing happens with common cause failure. Yeah, yeah, I know here. Common cause failure data. Uh, there are international efforts are going on. Uh, some of the agencies, international agencies and nuclear energy agency, uh, you know, um, uh, they are making a special effort uh, to collect data on common cause failure. So, these databases uh, can be very valuable um, in future. So, uh, and then software reliability. Software reliability, uh, uh, as far as digital system is concerned, uh, uh, nuclear industry is still uh, sort of I would say skeptical uh, depending on uh, digital system um, like uh, hardware systems uh, we, we used to have. So uh, this, this software uh, failure, why because uh, software uh, failure though software don't age so that is a plus point but uh, software can fail in a manner and especially it can fail in a manner because the same software is sitting on the three redundant module or three channels. So, uh, there is always a, um, though uh, coverage testing is done, uh, but then um, you know, there, is, uh, there are uh, cases when we, feel, when we feel that whatever testing was done, whether uh, the, uh, the coverage was sufficient, complete we can't say, but uh, whether it was sufficient. So, common cause failure um, uh, is a very, because it kills the redundancy. So, um, of course, um, deterministic um, um, pr procedures they work uh, very well here wherever common cause failure potential is there uh, there is a protection there is a pro defenses against those uh, common cause failure it could be physical protection it could be spatial prote protection uh, it could be you know uh, scheme of uh, power supply or you know uh, whatever configuration that we choose so that common cause failure and I think uh, and quite a bit has been done on in this area so like the, I was talking about quality attribute should uh, find answer to this subtle nature of things so that uh, uh, errors are there and uh, we have a very robust uh, risk model actually with us you know so uh, now once quality attributes uh, have been matched and our in, uh, peer reviewer if they have said ki, yes quality uh, uh, quality uh, features are, are very good uh, in this PRA then we do some sort of provision again you can say it might be called as a deterministic probabilistic that is called prognostics and health management. Uh, this is a relatively new technique. Uh, new technique uh, uh, why because uh, why because uh, uh, this requires uh, very good uh, fundamentals of science experiment testing and modeling. Uh, and then only uh, we can create a model. So that what what it is a very expensive approach actually. If I have to tell, uh, so the PHM has to be applied where it is required. It can give required benefits. So what we infer from here is PHM cannot be applied to all the components. But you see here 
this uh, this integrated model it really helps because we know from a risk assessment model that component can be safety importance indicates the safety significant of the component and if certain component has been contributing significantly to the uh, final results then probably that component it could be electronic it could be a valve also hardware component it could be a pump also uh, we need monitoring uh, uh, so uh, phm comes very handy uh, at this point of time because in phm what we do simply i'll come to the uh, detailing we put a sensor and whatever uh, precursor was a uh, predominant uh, you know uh, um, cause of failure uh, we monitor those precursor and this precursor monitoring uh, is sometimes comes in the form of a uh, in service inspection periodic in service inspection or uh, it comes online monitoring also so uh, according to me this is a very very important uh, module of uh, risk based engineering because the net result of this particular module is um, remaining life estimation now we'll 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 discuss with how this scheme works actually let's say we have uh, one aircraft and uh, normally 48 fractures they are monitored in uh, in aviation and uh, the life cycle loads uh, and if any indication is there uh, indication is there those particular areas are monitored further closely so in some way or the other uh, uh, this is there uh, phm is not altogether a new technique only now uh, now benefit is it can uh, it can uh, give information about remaining useful life of the component so the in directly or indirectly it helps in uh, in plant operating scenario ecosystem why because if i know that this particular component uh, though it is showing sign of degradation if it will be uh, working for uh, say a uh, couple of hours so in our couple of days then i can plan my uh, strategy uh, maintenance strategy repair strategy um, if it is working uh, suppose if the degradation is going to uh, with a rate where it can cross 2 3 months when my plant shutdown is coming um, annual shutdown is uh, scheduled so th then with a close monitoring uh, we can we can go and run the plant uh, and uh, without shutting down otherwise if i don't have information of its degradation rate uh, on a conservative basis i have to shut down the plant even uh, my tech spec will not allow but in P phm uh, we can keep monitoring and uh, of course phm doesn't take care of catastrophic failure let us be very clear about it wherever degradation are happening and they are very slow uh, it, it really helps okay so there are two uh, major techniques or rather i would say there are three major techniques uh, for implementing phm one is physics of failure technique it is basically if i to tell uh, it is a uh, science based methods where material uh, material life cycle loads uh, material property uh, its a degradation rate uh, and then uh, uh, then further Uh, uh, further if information is required uh, uh, life testing and then finally uh, physics of failure model is created um, if, uh, and if i put uh, the best example of this is uh, canary canaries are basically uh, you you have electronic board and you always bother about ki the board should not fail abruptly so uh, they since the stresses and uh, failure they are known uh, a priori so well that Uh, the canary itself the canary is nothing but a small uh, small uh, board uh, where the precursor failure is being monitored so it is actually in uh, in the main board uh, main electronic electronic board uh, we don't have to monitor on the board but uh, uh, we can monitor it on a um, separately on a canary and canary will tell you ki there is a incipient failure because we had uh, all the critical component it could be capacitor uh, it could be igbt so uh, we will know ki this failure degradation is taking place because temp uh, so many uh, cycles of temperature and uh, humidity the board has seen so much of time has passed so it, it will tell but this is a very expensive expensive technique you know uh, because understanding properties of uh, material and this thing so that's why this approach is used uh, along with a data driven approach data driven approach means 
the data is coming from uh, the, on the precursor is coming from the system or plant uh, component itself. Uh, the, there is a sensor uh, which keep monitoring the data. Its a time constraint is kept such that we get the uh, you know uh, we are not uh, get overburdened with the data. At the same time, we are not missing any data. Uh, so and then the domain specific analysis has to be performed. If we are doing for 40 year fracture, then 40 fracture data will be analyzed. If we are creating, uh, do, um, doing it for corrosion, then corrosion data will be analyzed here. And uh, if we are doing for, uh, let's say, uh, some thermal fluid and all that, so those kind of data, uh, data temperature, volume, and all. So depending on the domain specific thing, uh, this data will be monitored. Um, so, so now, uh, once the data is coming here, then it cannot be uh, ex uh, used in our uh, system uh, directly for analysis, data has to be pre-processed. Like suppose some vibration data has come. Now it has to be, uh, pre-processing means some uh, noise signal should go out of the, the data. So filtering will be required to be done. And then um, FFT uh, analysis has to be done. Uh, fast Fourier uh, transform analysis has to be done. And, and then in last, the feature, ex ex suppose if we are monitoring vibration, so unbalance, whether my, uh, my uh, and uh, at the outset, let me tell you, the, here, all the four modules, they require some intelligent treatment. So that means uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. These are the methods which are used, whether it is a pre-processing, uh, it could be uh, normal process also, but generally uh, PHM, uh, AI or machine learning has got a huge uh, contribution uh, in understanding failures and its prediction. So uh, feature is extracted. Now feature is matched. And then we found, ki, OK, now there is integration. So uh, in PHM itself, there is a third technique which combines these two. It is called fusion technique. So physics of failure uh, modeling and uh, data-driven modeling, they are combined to consolidate the results. So for this, we require st statistical modeling. And again, one set of machine, uh, machine learning programs and model, and then uh, like we see artificial neural network, uh, we have some predefined uh, vectors and then uh, whatever data is coming, uh, we map on that and we see whether our remaining RUL means remaining useful life prediction, uh, whether in uh, error, and if the error is there, what is the uncertainty bounds and all that. And that is where we take the decision uh, for implementing PHM. Now, uh, PHM, uh, I can say, if, if I have to use the word system health monitoring. Traditionally, like dams and structures, they were monitored. Uh, their health were monitored uh, through leakages, uh, through uh, some cracks, if it is visibility, and all those things. So th these techniques are there. They have been upgraded uh, to give uh, th this information online about the incipient failure. That means now, ideally speaking, PHM, uh, uh, power of PHM will be known only when it does remaining useful life prediction so that maintenance and uh, further mitigation action can be planned actually. So this is a very important thing and uh, uh, this forms an integral, PHM forms an integral part of uh, risk-based engineering. Um, and uh, so I was talking to you, what is the benefit of combining probabilistic and uh, deterministic technique? Um, you cannot implement PHM for um, all the components, or even for a few components. So the probabilistic risk assessment provides the safety importance or risk importance of uh, each component. If you see the cut, cut set list, uh, we will find uh, there is a, uh, there is a uh, importance me measure for this. So we can choose, uh, we can choose uh, depending on our resources, where all PHM has to be applied, so that at least the 20% uh, component which are of set significance, their PHM can be implemented. Reliability also can be interpreted uh, as a loss of reliability. Loss of reliability is a risk. Why? Because if suppose um, I am having a reliable power supply system, uh, rather, uh, you know, uh, electric power uh, station, and if power is not going to uh, houses, hospitals, roads, then that also produces, a, there is a risk component there actually. So reliability, so uh, in, in uh, risk-based engineering, uh, 
loss of reliability itself is a risk component so if i have to summarize then reliability also falls under uh, under the risk uh, potential actually so uh, if we say uh, risk based engineering even reliability issues are also answered actually now uh, here we have this comparison of uh, comparison with uh, risk acceptance criteria this particular matrix risk matrix which helps in taking decision actually so um, we we will know that risk is nothing but product of likelihood and consequences okay and the likelihood per year consequences could be uh, could be injuries uh, it could be uh, cancer risk it could be fatalities anything depending on the case so uh, so this will give us a risk statement now acceptance criteria have to be worked out for each domain because um, because finally resources are limited so um, so uh, the we have to uh, have a mitigation measure so which are the most important issues there we should focus more um, let's say uh, if we done, we have done uh, study and uh, we found uh, okay uh, the the our risk matrix ha has been developed like this that uh, consequences and likelihood so our risk matrix says low Uh, that likelihood is low is 1 into 10 to the minus 5 then medium 1 into 10 to the minus 3 and high is 1 into 10 to the minus 2 so this has been indicated by green color low uh, medium is by amber uh, color and red by high high risk so see similarly consequences now consequences could be negligible it could be fatalities it could be medium uh, one or two persons uh, death are high it could be couple of uh, this thing depending on the uh, you know uh, case or domain that we are talking about so this risk matrix helps us you know um, which which are the which are the events uh, they are falling in, in here so you don't have to bother but events which are falling in this are especially red category they need immediate attention now you see um, and this works and it is it is uh, uh, can be used uh, uh, for optimizing the resources also so this is one matrix uh, i have seen this is used in engineering uh, for risk based inspection uh, what kind of inspection should be do, done risk is risk level is low medium or high accordingly the inspection efforts have to because um, uh, in service inspection is a very uh, resource consuming activity um, yeah on hardware component especially passive components actually uh, risk matrix for operation uh, it could be uh, various uh, power failures leakages threat to safety functions so all those will get uh, answered by under, under low high or medium and finally we have a decision matrix decision ma ma matrix for uh, working out schedule uh, decision matri matrix for uh, operational supports whatever so and then uh, uh, this line uh, it indicates and there is some fuzzy partition uh, uh, i have shown here uh, because there is not a, always a crisp line here you know uh, i should have shown a gray area here also so the transition from this area to this area takes place in a uh, in fuzzy language we call from 0 to 1 point 1 some member was what so uh, of course here it is green here it is red but this color itself uh, uh, may not explain so there will be a band of gray color which we call fuzzy band so uh, this is a uh, acceptance uh, guideline uh, by us nrc uh, we have done the probabilistic risk assessment at the core damage cdf cdf means core damage frequency um, statement uh, from level 1 level 1 give core damage frequency level 2 gives large early release frequency and uh, level 3 gives risk to the member of public when it is in public domain now uh, you can see here uh, us nrc has taken a decision if area is uh, something like 10 to the power 4 uh, there are two uh, this matrix has two parameters one is code match frequency that is absolute value that means if you have if i have done a risk assessment for a plant the core damage frequency is 10 to the minus 5 uh, mean value and uh, um, i want to 
uh, I want to use, uh, I want to uh, uh, incorporate a change in the plant. So um, it could be some modification which might uh, enhance the reliability, but that should not happen at the cost of uh, uh, increasing risk. So uh, I'm doing that modification. So I'll, uh, I'll take that component or that change. It could be policy also. It could be hardware components. It could be practice also. Uh, maintenance practice or whatever. Uh, I, like I showed one example, uh, increasing the uh, um, maintenance or uh, reducing the maintenance frequency or test frequency uh, from uh, from uh, uh, one month to three months. So, um, so here uh, what I uh, I'll see uh, my see core damage frequency was ten to power minus five, and if my change in core damage frequency that is earlier value and the increase in value, if they are more than change in, uh, this thing is more than 10 to the power minus 5, then this becomes a prohibitive reason. No changes will be permitted. Okay. Now, if I go to level 2, the small changes will be permitted with some uh, conditions and all that. And uh, in level 3, um, uh, some uh, minor changes can be permitted. So uh, you can see there ki based on CDF matrix, uh, we have acceptance criteria. The moment my uh, uh, change in CDF is, let us say, of the order of 10 to power minus 4, that means I cannot implement that change. Uh, it might be increasing my uh, uh, throughput, my reliability, uh, but uh, that I, I, I should be very careful. Uh, this US NRC guide reference I have taken is 1.174. So this is for core damage frequency. Now, uh, we have discussed that uh, level two results are almost a decade lower because we have protection, we have the containment. So the containment uh, will reduce the risk of uh, uh, hazard uh, uh, compared to uh, level uh, level one. So here also US NRC has taken, if I think if, uh, if I go by this figure, it is uh, they have taken a figure of uh, a figure of ten. So here it was uh, in uh, core damage, it was 10 to the power of 5, 10 to the power minus 4, and this is 10 to the power minus 6 and 10 to the power of 5. Everywhere it, it has been divided by 10. Okay? So that means a factor of 10 level 2, that is a large early release frequency. So uh, this matrix LERF is another set. Uh, how, now, beauty of this whole uh, two matrix is this. If something is, is getting uh, prohibited by CDF, I'll go to the level 2 model and I'll see what are the changes. Finally, our aim is uh, our public should not be uh, put at risk. The risk to the public should not be more. So here, if you get uh, this LERF is uh, low and uh, the, here, uh, this uh, if I take even absolute value of tension minus 6, then so here we can find some room and we can give justification. Finally, it is the peer or the regulators, they have to accept our argument. Um, but yes, our containment might be so effective uh, that you know the, all these figures uh, will not show any compromise in terms of safety actually. So now uh, areas of application. This I am just brushing through one slide. Um, now PRA is be being our risk-based approach or risk-informed approach is being uh, used extensively one for regulatory review uh, because now regulators themselves have made, made it mandatory to submit a PRA level 1 and to some extent even level 2 also is desirable. So why? Because um, you get an additional insight into the uh, plant risk or plant safety actually. Then if I see the direct application of uh, uh, PRA, it is uh, in terms of uh, inspection program because as I told you, the earlier inspection program or de uh, deterministic approach to inspection program was uh, expert opinion and it was uh, uh, it was some uh, experience uh, based uh, or expert based approach but here you have mathematical model so uh, uh, optimization can be done uh, how frequently you should do test maintenance then since uh, we have a complete model of the plant we can do design optimization because where from we have uh, risk is coming uh, and we know the pathways. So target components, they can be improved, they can be reworked, they can be re-engineered 
uh, for this. Uh, one simple example is, suppose in my cooling system or especially emergency cooling system, we should have three pump, I should have three pump or I should have four pump or I should have two pump, how many pumps? So I know the flow criteria, I know the margin also. So um, um, the, this uh, PRA study will tell, okay, with three pump itself, you will achieve the desired safety or uh, risk reduction. Similarly, similarly uh, the control room conditions are now better understood. So, development of operator support system. Now, if I develop an operator support system, um, then I have the uh, open-ended problem. But if I have a risk model of the plant, I can focus on only all, all those events. Uh, first uh, first uh, item on our list will be to identify the plant condition which can be done using a artificial intelligence method wherein uh, artificial neural network identifies the conditions and with error. If a error is more than that, like any other operator, uh, 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 intelligent system also, they will give a warning and uh, they will say ki, this is the condition identified but the uncertainty in prediction is more. So, uh, operator can take a call. So, earlier the he was to understand the scenario, analyze the scenario, uh, data coming from the sensor, information from uh, areas, and now he has got some. So now, once the transient has been identified, the second part is diagnostics. That means the safety systems are performing all right or not. So, uh, if anything, any deviation is there in uh, safety system performance, a diagnostic module, uh, suppose if a, if a diesel generator has not come, why it has not come, data is coming from sensor, so uh, it can tell breaker has not opened, so you can uh, tell or some, break, uh, some contractor has not worked in control system. So accordingly, uh, the, since uh, there are data coming to the system, it will immediately announce and it will tell correct direction. Um, instead of you know delay which goes, which is very critical, uh, golden hours are lost in uh, uh, diagnosing the things and all that. So, but then all this knowledge base has to be built into the system. And the, here, uh, the faultry inventory, especially dynamic faultry inventory, uh, what we saw so far was a static faultry and static inventory. But now the science has uh, been extended to a dynamic uh, fault and inventory also. So, operator support system, especially for emergency condition. Why for emergency con condition? In emergency condition, the stresses are so high that operators, uh, it uh, um, might uh, have implication on operator's capability to take decision. So that is where a computer-based computer system, where the knowledge was uh, pre-stored, it can help. Then support to emergency management and mitigation, uh, insight from several management program. This is a routine thing, uh, feedbacks are taken and uh, you know programs are uh, further modified. And risk monitoring in a dynamic manner to assess impact of a change in a plant. So, um, since yes, data is coming like PHM, data is coming from signal, the uh, dynamic inventory and faultry they allow uh, and the change uh, configuration uh, decision can be taken uh, for change of configuration. Now, uh, this presentation or this uh, lecture series is based on uh, my book on risk-based engineering which was published by Springer in 2018. And, uh, I am going chapter wise, first it was an introduction that I have taken, risk characterization sort of it has been completed um, and then the um, before that uh, we did uh, the basic uh, framework, risk based engineering framework that we have completed. So we we have done the initial, um, initial uh, work to create the background for what will be coming in the future. There are 15 chapters in this book. And uh, out of these 15 chapters, uh, for this course, 12 modules have been created. Um, all of them, they may not be getting the uh, same treatment. So with this, uh, uh, we conclude this lecture. So thank you very much.